Welcome at the Planetary Health Academy. We're really, really happy to, that so many people are joining us for the very first lecture here. My name is Sylvia Hartmann. I'm a doctor and um, vice chair of the German Climate Change and Health Alliance. And this autumn, we're organizing the Planetary Health Academy for the second time. And this time, all the lectures are in English. And we're really happy to have Sam Myers from the Planetary Health Alliance today on the panel, Martin Herrmann, who's my colleague, also from the German Climate Change and Health Alliance, and Melvin Ocieno, who is from the um, Eastern Africa Hub on Planetary Health. So in the beginning, I would like to tell you a little bit more beh uh, from behind the scenes of the Planetary Health Alliance, uh, no, not Alliance Academy, and who's organizing it. And I prepared a little presentation as well. We're always saying Planetary Health Academy from knowledge to transformative action, because we're thinking that one of the most important parts is that all the knowledge we have on the topic of climate change and the connection to health is not only something we know, but that something that we also put into true and real action. And we from the German Climate Change and the Health Alliance, that's the organization behind the Planetary Health Alliance, were founded in 2017 from health professionals, doctors, nurses, and students out of the healthcare sector. And we saw this window of opportunity to really change something in the attitude of, or in the public opinion uh, on climate action. And as you all might see it and hear it, climate action and the climate crisis is a topic that's more often on, in, on the media, more and more, and more people are really concerned about this topic and trying to really do something in their personal field, but also on a political level. And that's where we also want to start and we want to enable people to become change agents themselves. So the team from the Planetary Health Academy are these six wonderful people, or five because you see me right now also speaking to you. And we are all from the medical sector more or less. And you might see um, all the people here either during the lectures or during the side events. Last spring, we had the Planetary Health Academy already in German with international speakers like, for example, Johann Rockstam from the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research, Nick Watts from the Lancet Countdown, and also he's now the Chief Sustainability Officer for the NHS, and Sabine Gaprisch, who is Professor for Climate Change and Health at the Charity and also the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And we're really happy to have her, uh, to have her on the panel for our very first lecture as well. Um, she's been accompanying our last lecture series um, for every session. And if you want to get a glance of the last lecture series, you can watch the trailer if you haven't done so yet. John made like a shortcut of all the most important quotes you can get. And my favorite one personally is the one from Nick Watts, who's just asking like, why would you do anything else than working on planetary health or the connection of climate change and health? And we're really happy that you're now in the audience from 73 different countries, which is really amazing. So guys, they're really, as I just said, amazing. And it's so cool because it's sometimes really difficult with the time zones. For us, it's like in the afternoon, but for other people, it might be like early in the morning or late in the night. So we're really happy to have you on board for our lecture series. And as it's sometimes now right here, we also are offering additional material for all the lectures. Sophie created it and you can see, find it under the materials section. It's for every uh, lesson and every lecture. We will upload it a few hours before the lecture. You can find material with um, suggestions on papers or videos and also topics for discussions. You will have the possibility to get a certificate for the participation of the Planetary Health Academy. You need to participate at five out of six lectures. So if you have a friend who's not participating yet, but where you know like he or she's really interested on interdisciplinary topics, you can still invite her or him to participate. And also for German doctors, you have the possibility to get like so-called CME credits or for the links function. Just Look for the link under the FAQ uh, under the section accreditation. Also, we are a network and that's called Health for Future. Health for Future is a network out of more than 50 local groups, mostly in Germany, a few in Austria and Switzerland. 
and it's really growing. And the great thing about Health for Future is that it's really living this from knowledge to transformative action. People are engaging locally as change agents by increasing their political so-called handprint. So they're not caring anymore just about the footprint, but they're really trying to, yeah, become an active um, citizen. And they're doing different actions, many actions on the street, like participating on demonstrations or doing visible actions like the one you can see down in the corner on the right hand side. It's like a di different version of the ice bucket challenge to show that was like during the summer that it's so hot that you can't do anything else to stay cool than just take a bucket of really ice cold water and um, yeah, to stay cool. But we're also doing other things as well. And there are several working groups, for example, on divestment of the pension funds for doctors, on green hospitals, on air pollution, medical education, on planetary health, on climate change and health, nutrition, and on politics. So if you're interested in Health for Future or our work, don't hesitate to contact us on info at planetaryhealthacademy.de. And we will try to help you or get you in touch with anyone else who could help you in your situation. Also, there's a really interesting event, the Lancet Policy Brief launch on 3rd of December. Um, if you're, it's mostly for German speaking people because it's mostly in German as well, but it's really interesting. And also the German Climate Change and Health Alliance has initiated this policy brief for Germany as well. And then now let's start. I missed one slide because, wait a second if I can find it. Um, yeah, the international exchange. As I said, you're coming for, from 73 different countries and therefore we thought it could be really, really great to just get in touch with you so that this Planetary Health Academy is not only a lecture series where you're sitting in front of your screen and listen to talks, but where you really can get in touch with the other people from other countries. And therefore we decided that on 3rd of December at 4 p.m. Central European time, we're doing a get together. And it's not, you don't have to have any experience on the topic or anything else. It's just, if you're interested, just join us. You can like register on the website under get involved. And there right in the beginning, you will find a map and also the link where you can register. Okay, so far, to the introduction. And now I'm really happy to have Sam Myers, director of the Planetary Health Alliance and also researcher at the Harvard School of Public Health here to give the first lecture on planetary health. And maybe let's start with a more personal question. Sam, what like made you interested in the topic of planetary health and what was the point where you said that's the thing where I want to spend the majority of my time on. <laughs> All right, well, I'll try to answer that before I go into the lecture. It's not an easy question to answer because I've been thinking about the connections between nature and human health since I was really in high school and then in college was confused about whether to be a a physician or a wildlife biologist or uh, an ecologist. And ultimately I went to medical school with an interest in, in the sort of intersection of environmental change and human health. I, I lived in Tibet for two years managing an integrated health and conservation project on the north side of Mount Everest. Um, I worked at USAID, I worked for Conservation International, always sort of in, as a practitioner in the field trying to connect natural resource management and human health and population issues. But ultimately, I felt like we really needed a, an academic field. We needed a whole discipline focused on these connections and that we needed an evidence base and that it was hard to really move that field forward without uh, an evidence base showing the connections between uh, our disruption of, of our natural systems and, and the human health implications. And so I came back to Harvard and did a clinical research fellowship and my master's of public health and spent the last 15 years really doing a lot of research to link 
um, changes in environmental conditions to uh, their human health implications. And it was sort of in the middle of doing all of that research that the uh, Rockefeller Foundation created this uh, Rockefeller Lancet Commission on Planetary Health that I participated in starting in 2014. And we spent a year writing this report that was published in July of 2015 as the Rockefeller Lancet Commission report called Safeguarding Human Health in the Anthropocene. And um, that was really kind of the launch of the field of planetary health in terms of public perception. It was the first time that this term really came out into the general public. Um, so there are many of us who'd been thinking about these connections for, for decades before that. Um, but once the term came out, I felt like there was an enormous opportunity to try to build momentum around this um, coming out party for the field. And so that we created the Planetary Health Alliance at the exact same time with the goal of sort of helping to bring together this burgeoning community around the world that was thinking about um, these questions of environmental change and health and um, start to think about how we build an educational platform and provide the educational resources that just like what you all are doing um, to support education in the field, uh, have an annual meeting, uh, create a newsletter, create a, a technological platform to connect people in the field. Um, so lots of things that we're trying to do through the Alliance and we can talk more about that later, sort of what our core activities are now. But um, so I don't really know how to answer your question of when I decided to dedicate myself to the field, I think well before the field even existed. Um, uh, but it's always been my central fascination of sort of the connection between the natural world and human well-being. And I think it's been sharpened by um, really delving into many different branches of environmental science and recognizing really the extraordinary urgency of the moment that we're in and the need to address these questions as, as kind of the grand challenge of, of, our, of our time. So anyway, I'm very happy to be with you. Um, should I go ahead and, and, and start my talk? Yeah, please. You're looking okay, first. So nice. can... All right. Well, as I was just saying, um, the field of planetary health is really, I think, you know, we're, we're a community forged in urgency. And there's uh, something about this particular moment in human history that I think is truly uh, unique. And um, I wanna try to explain that to you a little bit because I think it's about the, um, the scale and pace of human disruption and transformation of nature that's um, actually the, the origins of the field of planetary health. So um, in many ways, you know, there's never been a better time to be a human being. Uh, in the last 75 years or so, we've seen these really extraordinary improvements in uh, things like adult literacy that has nearly doubled um, between 1940 and 2015. If you look at um, the percentage of the population living in extreme poverty, uh, in 1950, there are 1.6 billion people in extreme poverty and only 920 million people who were not in extreme poverty. 65 years later, those numbers had switched from seven to 730 million people living in extreme poverty and 6.6 .6 billion people not in extreme poverty. So in other words, in that 65 year per period, the percentage of people living in extreme poverty around the world dropped from 62% to around 10%. Life expectancy has risen really dramatically over that same period and child mortality has fallen by a factor of four. Uh, and so we've seen these extraordinary improvements across human development, but the same uh, really amazing uh, scientific and technological developments that have uh, driven uh, really almost unimaginable improvements in uh, the education, wealth, health of the global human population have also been driving this extraordinary ballooning of humanity's total ecological footprint, the scale of our impact on our natural systems. And so if you look at these metrics of human consumption over time, whether you're looking at 
uh, appropriation of fresh water resources or proliferation of motor vehicles or production and use of synthetic fertilizers, paper production, plastic production, primary energy use. What you see are relatively modest impacts until about 1950 and then these really steep, almost exponential increases in just the scale of our consumption practices. And not surprisingly, if you look at metrics of our impacts on our planet's natural systems, you see very similar curves, whether you're looking at biodiversity loss or exploitation of fisheries or addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, ocean acidification, tropical and temperate uh, forest loss, you see similar patterns. And the reason that they all look so similar is that they're all underlain by these really fundamental trends of um, human population growth, which again was very stable for a long period and started to rise in 1900. And then around 1950, we see this really, really steep, uh, nearly exponential increase in the number of people sharing the planet with us. And that's coupled with this even steeper increase in per capita GDP and the amount of goods and services that each one of us is asking our planet to provide for us. And so when you multiply those two trends together, you get total GDP, the sum total of our footprint. And it really looks like we're sitting on top of this nearly vertical line in terms of our expansion uh, economically around the world. And so it's almost impossible to overstate the scale of the impact that we are now having on our planet's natural systems. In order to uh, feed ourselves, we've converted about 40% of the ice-free land surface for croplands and pasture. We're using around half the accessible fresh water on the planet, mostly to irrigate our crops. Uh, we're fishering around 90% of monitored fisheries at or well beyond uh, their maximum sustainable limits. We've cut down huge swaths of the world's forests, dammed over 60% of the world's rivers, and that number is on its way up to around 92% in the next several decades. Uh, we've got these really uh, you know, significantly growing issues of regional air, water, and land pollution. You all know we're disrupting the global climate system. And so all of these sort of vast transformations of our natural systems are now driving species loss that are about a thousand times the baseline rate. Uh, and actually the loss of population sizes of mammals, fishes, birds, reptiles, amphibians, actually by about 65% since 1970. So the number of animals sharing the planet with us has been falling very rapidly. Um, the recent IPBES report uh, warned that around a million species now face extinction, many within decades. And so the the overall scale of our footprint on our planet is clearly uh, really unsustainable. And the core premise of planetary health is that the scale of the human enterprise now uh, exceeds our planet's capacity to absorb our wastes or to provide the resources that we're using sustainably. And as a result, our activities are transforming all of our natural systems. So, you know, uh, Sylvia was talking a lot about climate change, but it's not just climate change, it's everything change. So uh, yes, we're disrupting the global climate system, but we're also driving global scale pollution of air, water, and soil. We're driving the sixth mass extinction of life on earth. We're changing biogeochemical cycles like the nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon cycle, dramatic changes in land use and land cover and scarcity of resources like fresh water and arable land. And that all of these human caused transformations of global natural systems are interacting with each other in complex ways that we're just beginning to understand, but which affect the core sort of fundamental conditions for human health and well-being, the quality and quantity of food that we can produce, the quality of air we breathe, um, our exposure to infectious diseases, our exposure to extreme weather events, even the habitability of some of the places that we live. And so ultimately, we're now seeing impacts across every dimension of human health. And so let me uh, try to show you a little bit what I mean. And um, 
this is just a, a diagram to show that just as we've sort of learned over the last several decades that um, there are really important social and cultural and political determinants of human health. There also are critical ecological determinants and that in fact human health is nested in a set of ecological conditions and as we change those conditions we see significant impacts across these dimensions of health and so in this diagram I'm focusing on nutrition and all the different ways that changes in biodiversity, climate, water accessibility, etc. can affect nutrition. In my own um, research I thought I'd just give you three very quick examples um, from the research that I mentioned at the beginning that we've been doing for the last 15 years or so, um, one area that we've been working on is looking at how rising concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are actually making our food less nutritious. And so working with agronomists around the world, uh, we were able to grow uh, 41 cultivars of six staple food crops, things like rice and wheat and maize and soybeans and sorghum. And we grew them at elevated carbon dioxide at levels we expect to see by the middle of this century. And we used this free air carbon dioxide enrichment uh, methodology. So the little ring you see at the bottom of the slide uh, in a field, you, you're growing crops inside this ring of carbon dioxide emitting jets. And in the center of the ring is a CO2 a sensor and a wind direction sensor. And when the CO2 falls below some prescribed level, the upwind uh, jets will release a little bit more carbon dioxide. So you can maintain the CO2 level inside this ring uh, at a prescribed level. And then you look at a cultivar of crops grown inside the ring and one that's grown outside of the ring that's otherwise experiencing identical um, uh, soil conditions and weather and pests and pathogens, and the only difference is CO2. And, and when we grew all of these crops over uh, 10 years on seven different locations on three different continents, we had a large sample size and could actually show that in fact, just elevated carbon dioxide is causing the iron and zinc and protein, these critical nutrients in foods to fall um, as a result of, of elevated carbon dioxide. And so we've spent the last several years then modeling what those nutrient changes will mean for the total nutrient intake of populations in 150 countries around the world. And we found that, in fact, just our addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere over the next 40 or 50 years is likely to push around 150 to 200 million people into new risk of things like zinc deficiency and protein deficiency, as well as, as exacerbating the deficiencies in around a billion people who already suffer from those. We are also are doing a lot of work on global um, pollinator declines, and we've written a couple of papers already about how um, loss of pollinating insects is likely to impact global health. We're now uh, in the middle of a project I'm really excited about where we found a completely different uh, methodology based on experimental observations from a network of farms on four different continents. And we can show what the yield reductions from inadequate pollinators are and then calculate what the health impacts of the, those lost um, pollinator dependent crops will be. Uh, so we're working on that. And we also have worked on how changes in ocean temperatures and in, in basically global ocean warming is leading to changes in the uh, distribution of fisheries and also the size of fisheries and how that will affect nutritional outcomes for around a billion people who are vulnerable to the loss of critical nutrients that they get from wild harvested fish. So lots of different kinds of projects all looking at how human um, caused changes in these natural systems come back to affect our own health as mediated in this case by nutrition. Uh, and so, you know, these are a few examples of within the sort of nutrition realm of uh, changes in nutrients, fisheries, pollinators. We're also working in Madagascar on how loss of access to wildlife in the diet is affecting the risk of nutritional deficiencies. But of course, there are many other questions like growing water scarcity, 
land degradation of arable land, what happens as more and more people are forced into displacement, which has huge impacts on uh, nutrition. Pollution, for example, ground level ozone is a potent plant toxin and reduces the yields of many of our crops. And then we're bound, and this is a, an overarching theme in planetary health, and we see it over and over again, we are bound to encounter surprises. So as we fundamentally change the biophysical conditions that we've been adapted for, for you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of years, uh, and we're changing those conditions at the fastest rate in the history of our species, we're bound to encounter additional surprises um, as, as those changes uh, sort of permeate through different systems. And of course, that's just nutrition, but we could have equally complex diagrams of the many, many different ways that changing environmental conditions affect each other uh, dimension of human health. And so just very quickly, uh, to summarize some of those things, you know, infectious disease is enormously sensitive to changes in uh, environmental conditions. And certainly climate change uh, has big impacts, particularly on things like vector-borne diseases, which are sensitive to soil moisture and temperature in terms of the life cycle of the insects that are often um, vectors for these diseases. But changes in nutrient content, changes in the biological composition of communities. Some of you have heard of the dilution effect, which has been shown that um, as communities become more biologically impoverished, as you lose species diversity, you tend to increase uh, exposure to infectious diseases. Certainly what we're going through right now with the COVID-19 pandemic is an example of um, really our very risky relationship with wildlife populations. We're experiencing more spillover events as human beings move into wildlife habitat in lots of different and complex ways. This is an example from Belize where these uh, upland farmers have been adding fertilizers to their fields in order to increase their crop yields, which makes all kinds of sense, um, except that the nitrogen and phosphorus run off from these fields into small streams, which then come into big rivers and ultimately end up hundreds of miles away in lowland Belize, where they encounter these uh, wetland systems, which are uh, dominated by typhal vegetation, this sort of reedy vegetation. And when you add nutrients to this system, you get a switch in the kind of vegetation that dominates. And that change in vegetation creates a different form of habitat, which actually favors Anopheles vestipanus, which is a different mosquito uh, from Anopheles albumenus, which used to be dominant in this system. The problem is that Anopheles vestipanus is a much more effective malaria vector. And so through this whole sort of cascade of ecological changes, these farmers in upland Belize, simply by adding fertilizer to their fields, are actually putting their lowland compatriots at higher risk of malaria exposure. And it turns out that when you look at systematic reviews of these kinds of nutrient enrichment experiments, you see this over and over again across six different continents that usually uh, nutrient enrichment is leading to increased infectious disease exposure. Another dimension that we worry a lot about is uh, growing population displacement. Last year, uh, we saw the largest number of displaced people in the history of uh, record keeping, over 66 million displaced people. Uh, most of them, or half of them, were children. Um, and there's a lot of concern that um, things like rapid sea level rise, more extreme storms, and loss of our coastal barrier systems, things like coral reefs, mangrove forests, wetlands, dunes, um, that as we lose those barrier systems and we have more intense storms and higher seas, that we're gonna see a lot of inundation of low-lying coastal areas, which drives population displacement. We're also worrying about increasing heat and crop failures, uh, leading to places becoming less habitable. And so there's a real concern that we're gonna see more and more population displacement, which has enormous uh, health implications for malnutrition, infectious disease, physical, sexual, psychological trauma, et cetera. The non-communicable diseases are a little bit less intuitive, but in fact um, are hugely important in planetary health. And so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the Lancet published their um, commission on uh, global pollution and health report. 
uh, and they found that uh, on average around 9 million excess deaths a year are resulting from pollution of air, water, and soil. And most of those deaths are non-communicable disease deaths, so they're heart and lung disease, strokes, uh, certain kinds of cancers um, being caused by exposure to pollution. There are also some things that are a little bit less intuitive, like loss of pollinators in our research. The major health effect of losing pollinators is that we we have less uh, pollinator dependent crops, which tend to be things like fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, legumes, which often have a very protective effect in preventing things like heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and certain cancers. And so the major excess mortality associated with losing pollinators is from non-communicable diseases. The kinds of nutrient changes that we're seeing in our CO2 nutrition work um, we see uh, losses of protein in uh, staple food crops, and instead we're increasing the carbohydrate. But when we do that um, to the diet of volunteers, what we find is that substitution of dietary uh, carbohydrate for protein actually increases the risks of heart disease. And so now we're sort of doing that experiment across the entire global population by adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So there are many ways that we're seeing these effects on uh, non-communicable diseases. And then finally, uh, an area that I think is really under-researched, and I, I hope there'll be more um, coming along soon, is thinking about the mental health effects of our transformation of nature. Um, you know, there's been a lot of research showing the impacts of these extreme events of uh, natural disasters like the horrible hurricane seasons that we're having this year and had a couple of years ago in the Caribbean or um, the terrible fires that we've been seeing in the Western parts of the United States and Australia and the Pantanal and Brazil and even in Siberia. Um, and, and these events where people are losing homes and losing lives clearly have enormous mental health impacts in terms of anxiety, depression, joblessness, even suicidality. And we know those effects are quite durable, that if you go back, for example, uh, to the community where Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans 15 years ago, you can still see uh, the mental health effects of those disasters. But there are other kinds of mental health effects that are maybe subtler, but also potentially much wider spread. Um, there's been some really interesting research out of Europe and North America among young couples who uh, have decided not to have children. And one of the reasons that they're not having children is that either they don't want to bring their children into a world that's in sort of environmental chaos, or they don't think it's responsible to add any more burden uh, of the sort of total human enterprise to the planet. And both of those are clearly you know, profound concerns about the state of the global environment. And it suggests that we're sort of maybe the tip of the iceberg around just the kind of anxiety that so many of us uh, carry, whether it's you know, called ecological anxiety or um, Glenn Albrecht talks about solastalgia. Uh, but I think many of us carry a concern that our own activities are putting um, other people and future generations in harm's way. Uh, there's a lot of uh, anxiety around the loss of cherished places, cherished species. What does it mean that my uh, children may never see a flourishing uh, coral reef or some of the charismatic megafauna that we're all connected to? Um, and so these are big questions that really haven't been answered very well where there needs to be much more um, research. And so that's sort of the the diagnosis side, right? That, that our vast transformation of nature, which is accelerating, is now really driving a global health crisis and that there's nearly, uh, there's really no dimension of human health that isn't being significantly impacted by environmental transformation. When we think about, okay, so what's the treatment? What do we, what do, we do about this problem? Um, you know, I think you need to move further upstream and sort of look at these root causes. And fundamentally, this is really about how 
we're living on Earth, the sort of the scale of our of our ecological footprint. And so how do we lower our ecological footprint? And fundamentally, it's pretty clear that if we continue on our current trajectory, we're going to get into a lot of trouble. And so we need a course correction. But there's really no reason not to be uh, hopeful about the potential for that course correction. You know, there's no reason why in a hundred years our grandchildren can't live in a world where um, human population has stabilized simply as a result of the demographic transition uh, from educating girls and providing economic opportunities for women and access to family planning for couples who want it, um, where we've transitioned to a post-combustion energy economy because we have to and we have no choice and the solutions are right there in front of us um, where uh, we're actually realizing massive efficiencies in how we produce food which are all starting to emerge around us right now as well as uh, manufacturing and the circular economy where Europe is really a global leader um, where we're designing our cities so that they really uh, optimize and maximize our physical and mental health while minimizing uh, our ecological footprint. And so there are a whole series of sort of um, technological uh, innovations that are sort of part of what some people are calling the great transition or the great turning, um, which I think are extraordinarily important. There's also, it, it's technology won't be enough, right? And innovation won't be enough. And I think there's a, um, a level of culture change that's also going to be needed. We need to, I think, reject uh, the narrative that comes through our telephones and our computers and our televisions that um, in order to be happy, uh, what we need to do is endlessly acquire more stuff. Uh, and we need to instead accept what we know from our social scientist colleagues that actually what really makes us happy is spending time with the people that we love, being invested in something that's bigger than ourselves, taking care of the places that we love. Um, and so th there needs to be a shift in how we think about that. Um, we need to embrace knowledge from you know, many uh, different places, including indigenous knowledge, uh, faith traditions, uh, the arts and humanities, because I think that um, underneath uh, the ecological crisis that we're facing and underneath the global health crisis that that, that ecological crisis is now uh, precipitating, there's also a bit of a spiritual crisis that we have become uh, disconnected from uh, the reverence and the awe for the natural world that so many of us uh, often feel that, that that reverence has lost its authority or its agency in guiding our decisions and that somehow we need to rethink our relationship to uh, the natural world and um, have some different stories to tell ourselves about our place in the world. There's a need for movement building and activism and the kinds of things that Sylvia was talking about coming together collectively and holding our governments accountable and industries accountable. Um, and fundamentally, there's probably a need to really think about how we um, restructure uh, at the level, particularly of the universities, um, how we generate uh, knowledge, how we work across disciplines, because all the things that I've been talking about are just enormously transdisciplinary. And so to do effective research, uh, to come up with effective solutions, uh, to make policy change requires um, working in teams across disciplines, which is not, uh, at least in the United States, the way our universities tend to be structured. And so there's a need for, for thinking about how we generate and mobilize knowledge as well. So, um, I invite you to uh, check out the Planetary Health Alliance um, to uh, sign up for our newsletter, to uh, participate in our annual meeting, which will be virtual this year and free uh, and is happening in April. Uh, and so be part of our community. We welcome you all. Uh, and I'm supposed to mention that we've just uh, finished writing a textbook about everything I've been talking about, which is gonna be available actually just the end of this month in Europe. So uh, thanks so much for all your time and uh, I look forward to questions.
Thank you very much for your talk, Samuel. And um, it might even come out in French, as you said, like for people who are like more comfortable reading in French, <laughs> but it might take some time. Okay. Also, Martin, do you have a question? Because before we take a question from the audience, I also wanted to, because you're one of the moderators as well, and I didn't give you the time to introduce you. Sorry for that. <laughs> you're you're mu muted, Martin. No problem. Um, I will introduce myself later. Okay. Um, no, I don't have a question at that time. Uh, let's take a few questions from the audience and then I might add something. Okay, good. And Sophie, it's your turn. Yeah, thank you very much for this very rich presentation. So we have a lot of questions from the audience. I'll start right away. One uh, question that came up was how did the COVID-19 pandemic affect climate change and planetary health and human health so far this year? Yeah, so planetary, I mean, so, so COVID-19 is sort of an interesting planetary health problem, I think, in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, one is just the origins of the uh, virus itself and the fact that it comes out of this, as I said, sort of risky relationship we have between humans and wildlife, whether it's the kinds of um, live animal markets in China where this uh, virus emerged or um, you know, bushmeat hunting, which goes on around the world, uh, incursions into wildlife habitat from agriculture, mining, timbering, you know, other um, extractive industries. In many ways, human populations are really pushing in on wildlife. And we, we have known for decades that that's risky. We've predicted for decades that we'll see these emerging pathogens. We know that around 75% of emerging pathogens since 1950 have been these kinds of zoonotic infections. So um, this is sort of confirmation of what we've been warning about for a long time. But I think that um, it's, it's interesting in other ways too. Um, you know, the, the, for the first time in human history, we have seen uh, global, massive, rapid, collective behavior change. Um, something that, you know, we've never seen. And I think it's actually really inspiring that uh, human beings can dramatically shift the way they live in response to an exogenous threat, which is essentially what we're facing in planetary health. And so I think that's instructive. I think the fact that nature regenerates uh, is important to take note of that, you know, when we stop beating on it, it tends to start coming back and air quality improves and water quality improves and animals start moving into places where we haven't seen them. We're also learning that nature is an enormous source of solace. It, it feeds us. And so as all of us are going through this massively stressful time, many of us are turning to our parks and our public places and our public lands as a source of solace and valuing those places in ways that we haven't um, before. We're learning that science really matters, um, that places like my benighted country that ignore the science and pretend that it doesn't exist get really hurt by ignoring science and that places that have taken that science seriously and um, taken steps toward uh, surveillance and, and everything else ended up faring much better. And I think that's an important lesson for planetary health. And finally, in some ways, I think it's opened this, this moment of opportunity where, um, you know, I think that the best leadership in the world is actually happening right where you all are in Europe, but the, the opportunity to take the stimulus packages that will be necessary because of the economic devastation we're experiencing and use those stimulus packages to create a new world to, you know, this, as the slogan goes, to build back better, but to really support this great transition that we're talking about by building the infrastructure, by investing in the new ways of living on earth um, that have promise instead of propping up the old ways that are sort of choking the life out of our biosphere. Um, and so there's an enormous opportunity in both the stimulus packages and foreign assistance packages uh, to build a new world out of this moment. So I, I think there's a lot that's relevant about, about COVID. Thank you very much for this elaborate answer. Um, 
I will continue with one more technical, a little bit more technical question, and then maybe give back to the panel. Um, one participant remarked uh, very rightly that um, most it's mostly health professionals talking about planetary health so far. Mm -hmm. And you outlined very well that planetary health is uh, inherently transdisciplinary and that we need more disciplines on board. So how can we move towards that and how uh, can we include more disciplines? Well, I think it's a good question. Um, I think there was a little bit of, of um, a strategic decision there. You know, in a lot of ways, the environmental scientists were here before we as health practitioners were. And, you know, when I was working at Conservation International in the 1990s, people were talking about how human health and well being was inextricably linked to natural systems. But they weren't really pointing to a lot of evidence. It seemed like it was sort of a statement of faith. And I think it was received with a little bit of skepticism because it was so clearly in the interest of an environmental organization to make that to make that argument. So I think what's been missing, in fact, was that the, the vast infrastructure around the world that's dedicated to human health, whether it's clinical or population, you know, public health, the ministries of health, the schools of public health, the medical schools, the huge army of clinicians around the world, that if that community can understand that even if you don't care about the environment for its own sake, even if you've never hugged a tree, um, and that's not, you know, where your orientation is, that you have to be thinking about these in global environmental changes in order to effectively safeguard human health into the future. And so I think that's really been the focus of the field of planetary health initially. But now I think you're right that as we kind of reach that recognition, then we need to sort of start looking around and finding our partners across universities, across ministries, you know, where at whatever level we're working in, to, to be effective in doing research and advocacy and implementation. And so um, I think as a, as a field, you know, we should continue to be sort of having a very big tent and inviting anybody who wants to engage. And one of the things we're doing at the Planetary Health Alliance is trying to identify some of the sub communities, whether it's urban designers or um, people working on food systems or people working on you know, circular economy and sort of trying to help make the bridge between planetary health and each one of those uh, communities to sort of bring those representatives into the planetary health community, because I think that is really important. Sam, I actually would like to um, build on your on your just what you were saying, because I think it's really, really important that we understand that the health sector might be a potential game changer. And uh, Johan Rockström was saying in the last lecture of uh, the summer uh, to all to, to the whole uh, audience that he felt we need to kind of move beyond the environmental framing of the challenges to a health and security framing of the challenges and part of it was also very clearly pointing to that health professionals are at the key kind of, of making this happen. And uh, I have two questions related to it. One is, it is clear that we need to be very fast in educating our peers as health professionals, because while we are seeing that a critical number of people are starting to understand it, yet huge numbers of our colleagues haven't even understood how, what the connections are. And then there's the second thing, it's not enough if we understand the science, it's really how do we move forward to also educate our patients and educate the uh, uh, public and educate the uh, uh, political decision makers on the subject because when they understand that it is threatening our health, uh, the kind of say they are much more easy to mobilize for radical change. If I uh, diagnose a cancer, it is clear that uh, the actions will require a traumatic shift in how a family might live. And uh, we are not yet having the courage uh, to, to really uh, out in the public having this diagnosis that it is like a cancer. It's a life threatening kind of global illness or uh, situations we are, we are kind of confronted by. So we need to be really clear in the diagnosis and then also mobilizing for moving forward. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with that more, Martin. I think that's exactly right. Um, I, I think that, you know, there are a lot of ways we can be doing that. The Planetary Health Alliance has, has launched this Clinicians for Planetary Health um, initiative precisely with that 
idea, you know, clinicians are the most trusted messengers in the world, um, particularly nurses. Uh, in the United States, they've been the most trusted messenger for the last 17 years in a row. Um, globally, I think firefighters and nurses keep, keep switching back and forth, um, and doctors are somewhere down below. below. Um, but when you think about the fact that clinicians touch almost every single person on the planet, regardless of you know, their politics or anything else, um, messages that are connecting the things that we can be doing for our own health that are also really important for planetary health, things like eating vegetable-based diets and muscle-powered locomotion, you know, getting around on bicycles and by foot and having our uh, neighborhoods designed with clean energy and um, walking and bike planes and, you know, many things that have been pioneered actually in Europe, um, that those messages are, are really important to get out to the public. And I agree that um, it's not enough to be doing the research. I think we sometimes gloss over though how important the research actually is too. I, I think it's both because sometimes people, and, and, and I'm completely sympathetic, but people get impatient and say, enough with all the research, we need to get out there and change things. And there's no question, we do need to get out there and change things. But one of the things that's actually prevented the field from moving forward starting in the 1990s was a lack of evidence. And so if you really want to be convincing the hard boiled, pure health, you know, the ministries and the schools of public health, that this is what they have to care about, you have to show them evidence. And so we're just building that evidence now. But so we need both. We need researchers and we need to understand these connections. But we also need activists and educators and we need to be um, trying to foment change at the same time. And, and we can actually combine that as well with like um, implementation research, right? Yeah. In the in the in the commission, the implementation, what was it called? Um, challenge. The yeah. gap was pointed out as like there's a lot of research more on the knowledge part. How does it hit us back in the face that we mess up the planet? But how can we live in a more sustainable and healthy way? And how do we scale this up on a larger scale that a lot of research is also needed to accompany that and scale it, etc. That's right. That's exactly right. I just want to add to this. I think it's very, very important that we have also different kind of research because a lot of the research is focused not on things that are really critical for moving forward, whereas this uh, uh, planetary health research is really kind of very, very critical. So we need more research, but at the same time, we need researchers who are able to also move things into action and speak to the decision makers and policy makers. This is one of the critical gaps in a transdisciplinary work. And it takes courage also that you have proven in Sabine to move into a field where you have very little kind of support in the beginning. Because still most of research is kind of headed towards where kind of the mainstream is running. And you get uh, a lots of grants and all of this when you're doing more uh, mainstream research. That's not what is needed. There's a different kind of research needed, very much more focused and also on kind of focusing on the transformative parts of, of bringing this to life. I think that's right, and I and I I anybody who's a young researcher now, I I think that what you said about policy application is so important. So we won't we won't start a research project without understanding what policy change we want to create as a result right from the beginning. And often, like we've been doing research on the land use um, change and fires in Indonesia and the health effects of the haze episodes in Indonesia from the fires and. You know, we were very focused on having a member of the peatlands restoration agency in the office of the president on our research team who was giving us policy scenarios that were actually in discussion and relevant so that when we modeled the health impacts of these different policy decisions we were modeling things that were reasonable that might actually be done by the government and i think that really changes how effective your research can be so um, I do think that's very important. This is not curiosity-driven research. This is um, applied research. Yeah. I'm amazed at how many people. I'm just looking at the participant list. You've got about 900 people. Congratulations. It's wonderful. Yeah, thank you very much, Sam, I would say. Thank you very much for your participation. And I hope that all these people listening now also will bring the message to other people. That's 
what we're aiming for, at least with the session. And so I would give the world to Martin. You're also at the German Climate Change and Health Alliance. And also we are, last time we were moderating the session together and we're also moderating it together this time. But as today, you're also giving a talk. I started the session and yeah, maybe you could just introduce you and then we will listen to your talk on transformation also for the others because Sabine, you um, also um, entered the discussion now. As I said, like you, you accompanied our last lecture series, like every lecture series, and you're the person in Germany for planetary health who brings it forward as a research topic. And we're really happy to have you here on board as well. And thank you for participating in the discussion. So Martin. Thank you very much, Silvia. First, I want to thank to Sam because uh, I've seen now this uh, lecture twice, two weeks ago uh, when you were giving it uh, in the Eastern African Planetary Health Hub. And I must say it's one of the best kind of introductions into planetary health, extremely comprehensive to the point covering all major things, but given in a very calm and convincing way. So we are very, very honored that you are our partner and it's just great to have you as someone discussing with us, working with us, knowing kind of your dedication to research, which is really critical for what we're all about. And when I now talk about transformative action and this kind of gap we are in between the research and the knowing and then jumping to the transformative action, it is very clear that while we go also and focus on the action side, we always need to deepen our understanding. So it's very important to go deep and go broad and learn about new fields. And from all the people that I know in our network, kind of most of these people have this dedication to learn more. We give advice to each other on what is the best book? What is this? Have you seen this talk? So it's really, there's a huge passion to learn, to understand, to give things forward, but also then see how do we bring it to life to kind of stay within this challenge you were pointing to. You were saying in your talk, it is everything change. So it is really, uh, you know, we are looking at all different fields and that's also something that I like with the concept of planetary health, that it is all encompassing. Uh, you were talking about some moments that is very critical now. And I think we're all aware that the next years might be decisive for doing the course correction you were talking about. This huge kind of tanker that now needs to move in a different direction perhaps we even need to rebuild from the tanker, not a tanker, but many smaller ships who are now able to maneuver into kind of the fields we have to encounter. So thank you very much for this. And I'm very much looking forward to our continued cooperation with you, and perhaps even to invite you towards the final session to join in for a few minutes. Thank you very much that you are our partner. So to myself, I'm very happy to be the chair of the German uh, Climate Change and Health Alliance, having founded it together with Sabine and Sylvia and others three years ago. From my own background, I'm a medical doctor and I have been focusing on implementing transformative change with large organizations and in different settings since almost 30 years. So that's uh, kind of the biggest now challenge I'm encountering and uh, I want to, to introduce you to some key ideas that might help you in your own moving into this kind of direction of transformative change. Um, what is very important that, and all the people who are in it know that, that while we learn and we kind of have a certain framing and perspective, it really, when you move into transformative action, you move into the open. So no one of us is a specialist. I'm always amazed how some people who start just the field how great they are doing. So it is not that any of us is an expert and, and I, whatever I give you now as a framing is just a preliminary framing. We will come back to this conversation of what is transformative change? How does it work? What might be the next thing we jointly do? What are things that we can do individually over and over again? And over time you will see there's a certain framing that might be helpful, but I'm sure that also in the next three, six months we will learn new things that no, what, no one of us had uh, kind of thought about before. So I will share my screen and just for not even 10 minutes, share some of the key things you perhaps want to bear in mind with your own encounter into moving from knowledge into transformative action. Yeah, so the first thing, and perhaps it's the most important thing to understand that when you know, you cannot just move into the field of action. It is a different field. 
So it takes a jump. And especially when you're not just executing routine actions, but you move into a new field, it is important to be aware you have to jump and you have to jump again and again. And also we as a movement have to jump and we have to jump into the movement because things are highly dynamic, especially in this month and in these years. And there's a second thing, you do your first steps with things where you have an idea that this might be in your environment, something you want to start with. And really for starting, it's not so important what you start with, but it's important that you start, that you start and that you experiment. And so also you allow yourself to fail because it is clear when we work on some things that we have never worked on before, like children learning to walk or language, we need to be able to fail and to learn from our mistakes. But we should do it in a way that we are fast with it and that we are failing forward individually, but also collectively. As I've mentioned, it is acting into the open. It is leaving aside some of the things we have learned. It is leaving aside all the rules that might be kind of given by, by society or environment to really trust to move into areas that we didn't know before. It is also clear that because we need to do big change fast, we have to look for what are strategic options, what are areas where there's real movement possible where things could be potentially catalytically changed. Then it is important when we are moving forward and we are having more comprehensive actions that we do plan, but also that we leave enough, of spa uh, enough space for improvisation. It's much more about the improvisation in actions and only having a plan because it is clear what we have in front of us. It cannot be the one plan that really works out. And the last point that I want to mention kind of for the introduction is really you need to reach out for networks, for friends, for unexpected partnerships. But oftentimes your existing networks and the existing friends are not the area where you might encounter a lot of energy to move forward. So it's important to stay open. And for example, with some of my friends and some of my family, I've learned there's no point in discussing with them too much, but I have met other people and some of them very unexpected people that are now my friends and partners in crime to kind of make things really happen and go fast. Uh, this is an important visual. It's just pointing to the complexity of human agency. And uh, what is important is that oftentimes people expect as an individual that the area where they could make a difference is in everyday action and individual as an individual actor, actor which mostly then ends up to change your consume to kind of have different consumer choices. But if you look at the whole field, you see that kind of there are huge opportunities also in the strategic and political actions and co in collective actions together with others in building social movement. So it is very important that we are not narrowing down where we could get into action, but are really prod and especially see each other as potentially political movers and shakers that have even with sometimes more powers than the political representatives. Um, as this is another important visual test points to the three levels of actions that you could look at. You see below the niche levels, that's kind of where we as change agents normally would start. And a change agent in the beginning in the niche level has difficulty to explain yourself. Then in the middle, you have some mainstream who is kind of continuing to run in a certain defined way and changes are only happening very slowly. And uh, we are understanding that our society and culture is very much a fossil kind of culture and society. All the, uh, the, the, the um, money and things are connected to the existing kind of ways of using energy. And then you have the third level of sudden events. What you see here in this graph, that in the middle, the niche level has already started to change some things. So some people are being affected. And I would argue that at the current moment, that is what is happening in our society. So for example, in Germany, we have in television um, kind of this theme week on kind of how do we want to live? And we are seeing uh, um, films and documentaries that were unthinkable one or two years ago. So you see kind of a shift of what we can talk about within the mainstream and the discussions after the films and the documentaries are pointing to how much is possible to discuss now that was not possible to discuss two years ago. 
um, from the sudden events that might be relevant for our, our work is, for example, one year ago, two years ago, Fridays for Future kind of entered the stage. No one was expecting them. They clearly have shifted what we're doing. Nine months ago, we had kind of the COVID crisis coming, which is also shifting things to an extent that were unimaginable. It is important for us as change agents to kind of consider what is happening right now, where are new openings and what can we do individually, but also jointly. So then just a few more thoughts, a 3.5% rule. This is uh, research from Harvard from a social scientist who was showing that if in a certain environment, 3% um, of a, a of the population are moving in a certain direction, they can change the kind of the majority. So when you have change, you don't need a majority in the beginning. You need just a critical number of people who understand themselves as actor and then move the overall kind of uh, uh, majority in the directions they were not anticipating themselves. So we would try to reach from 1%, 1.5% to 2% to go to 3%. That's also important when you work in any environment, in a hospital, at a university, in a group, you don't need to have everyone on board from the beginning. It's enough if you go to a second or third or fourth player and then move things forward. Then it is important to look at the timing. Sometimes we have to be patient and wait for an opening to occur. And then when an opening is there, we can be very fast. Last point, um, transformation triggers crisis when we really move in the direction we want to go to certain fields of economy will kind of disappear this will cause crisis at the same time as we see with the covid crisis covid opens up windows of opportunities that were not predicted before so it's always important to see what is opening up what is closing down how can we anticipate the crisis that might emerge from a transformational move and how can we prepare for that the crisis is not getting too bad. The last point about the relevance of the health sector, I think I have discussed jointly with um, Sam. And uh, no. this is also what I have pointed to already before. And to finish, this is inspired by Hannah Arendt and the Luisa Neubauer, just a few steps that it's important to bear in mind. So we are not only consumers, we are social beings, hence talented for the political dimension. Everyone can achieve something in their context, no one else can. So it's important to own the uniqueness of the context you're living in and the unique contributions that you might be able to give. Second point, once you understand the crisis that we are in, you start sensing an ethical imperative to act. And that's not just happening with you, it's also happening with others. And from this ethical imperative, this is kind of the basis from where ideas will come, how to move forward. And that gives us the rigor to stay also when it gets difficult. Third one is to cooperate and network with other change agents. And there's a fourth step is to reframe power, moving from power as ruling to power as emerging between people. Most people have a definition of power as ruling or being ruled. And then also very important, when you share power, it grows, it gets more. And that it, this gives you kind of then also the ability and the potential to deal with the vested interests that we have to fight against. And last point, we are the players, very important. The large companies, the fancy and famous, the political representatives will not drive the ball. Therefore, it is important that we take each other serious. So once in Germany, you have been seeing um, so documentary with Greta, um, there it was very obvious how in a lot of the political meetings kind of they're going to the loops and through the motions, there's oftentimes not real openings for new action. So it is us who have to bring these openings into the political scene. So these are just some ideas to play with. We'll come back to this and uh, I now stop. And uh, um, as I said, we will come back to all of these ideas and even more important, the Health for Future uh, network and the networks you might be part of or you might found are the places where we play with these ideas. 
and I'm very happy to, to, to see many of you in some of these kind of action-oriented meetings and in action with you. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Mel Wynn. Uh, Mel Wynn is for me one of the most inspiring change agents I've met in the last year. And uh, she's the founder of the Planetary Health Eastern African Hub. So she's building in Eastern Africa uh, kind of what we are trying to do here. And I think you are all aware, everyone listening now and, and seeing this, you are all aware that we can only make it happen through a network of global partners. So she is our global partner. She's in her final year doing a Master of Science in Environmental Health at the University of Eldoret in Kenya. And uh, I'm very, very happy to have you uh, as a speaker today. And Melvin, I would like to ask a first question, which is, what brought you to planetary health and why are you so passionately dedicated to it? Okay, thank you so much, Martin, for the warm welcome. Um, to be honest, I knew about planetary health through my master's supervisor, that is Professor Sano Odipo, who had already participated in the establishment of the 12 cross cutting principles of planetary health education, and he has attended uh, planetary health annual meetings. So he identified my leadership opportunity uh, capabilities through the undergraduate research work group under his supervision. So on my enrollment for the master's studies uh, late in 2018, he actually informed me about the Planetary Health Campus Ambassadorship uh, opportunity and shared with me two uh, planetary health articles to read prior the application. And eventually I was appointed as one of the 2019 Planetary Health Campus Ambassador. And actually I was the only African by then since we were a total of six uh, global students. Yeah. And I'm um, passionately uh, dedicated to planetary health uh, because it's a concept that brings knowledge acquired into action among the like-minded individuals who aspire to tackle environmental issues. I actually wanted issues in my region such as hunger and poverty to be reduced drastically at some point. And also if we see extreme weather changes in some parts of the region that are leading to uh, flooding, for example, can result into some diseases like malaria and also waterborne diseases. And we find out that these consequences can lead also to displacement of uh, people and eventually uh, tamper with their mental health. So another thing is that uh, individuals who are still burning charcoal in my country, for example, due to maybe lack of knowledge or uh, and, and maybe they don't know what uh, it takes to pollute the environment. And this can result into their the respiratory diseases. And I, I would like uh, them to learn more about these consequences. And now that COVID-19 pandemic is here with us, maybe this can be uh, affecting uh, individuals and can lead to death, yeah. That's why I'm passionately dedicated to planetary. I want to just solve uh, some major environmental solutions uh, together with the global community as well. You have already pointed out that with some of these issues, you start seeing the interconnectedness that Sam was talking about kind of in your concrete environment in Kenya. Perhaps you can uh, explore a bit more and uh, either bring one or two more examples. Yeah. Of, uh, kind of how you see the different the connections of different things overlaying each other and building patterns that, uh, you know, without the perspective of planetarians are difficult to understand. Yeah, I would like to say the dimension of on malnutrition that Sam had also mentioned earlier uh, is that we find that in Kenya, COVID-19 has really caused untold suffering, especially in families living in the poor urban areas who normally rely on the informal day-to-day -day employment. So majority of these families in Kenya are struggling just to feed themselves. Therefore, in many cases, um, we find out that they cannot access to a balanced diet, uh, and this can further threaten the lives of their children. And you find out that uh, for a healthy child to grow, they also require enough proteins to, for proper growth and development. So it is actually the most difficult situation for both the children and parents uh, with the measures which the government has taken uh, with the school closure up to now. Yet ma many children uh, also relied on school meals 
but they have now been forced to stay at home. So they will end up being malnourished in, in most cases. And also we find out that in Kenya, during these travel restrictions and uh, partial lockdowns, uh, for example, in the coastal region, they depended mostly on, uh, uh, on tourism industry. So they were very much affected. So in other words, poverty and hunger is on the rise as a result of food insecurity, uh, and this will lead to malnutrition. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when we had discussed before that even before COVID, malnutrition and hunger was rising because of other dimensions of planetary health. Kind of, can you elaborate a bit more on what are the other reasons why you have again more hunger in countries like Kenya? Okay, another reason is that um, you find out that uh, there is no, uh, there is no correct uh, research work being done at the moment. Uh, you find out that the research work going on uh, in some maybe um, in some areas they are not conclusive that um, malnutrition can be solved. So this will impact a lot in it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, your building the planetary health hub in Eastern Africa. What are the activities you are starting with? What are you doing there? Um, actually, we started on by drafting the vision, um, which focuses on ad advancing local community building and also public education, and also uh, educating students and uh, issues to do with policy influence. So I started off by uh, involving the students in planetary health uh, during my ambassadorship opportunity for planetary health. And I also visited some learning institution and encouraged sustenance of initiatives and also formation of uh, clubs. We also uh, started on by creating awareness to the public concerning planetary health through activities that involve engaging the local communities as well as policymakers and through workshops. Uh, and also through the leverage networks available, we were able to set up a network of members to be involved in it. And also some of the activities that some members involved were developing in, in educational curricula and learning resources for transformative action. Great. Now, what is shifting since we have the core team building the hub? What are countries where things are starting to emerge? Pardon? What are the countries where now beyond Kenya, the work is starting as well? Um, we, we are working closely with Zambia, Sudan, um, Mauritius, Uganda. Yeah, th those are just some of the few, and also Madagascar. Those are just some of the few uh, countries that we are working closely with. Yeah. yeah. What, are some the, what are some of the challenges you are confronted by? Um, at first, um, we, I had the issue of communication. Actually, um, managing people drawn from different countries to do joint activities that suits their interest uh, for planetary health was hectic at, at first. Um, but this challenge has been solved through collaboration and partnering efforts with the already formed uh, planetary health uh, networks, um, such as Planetary Health Campus Ambassador. And also we've been receiving a huge support from the Women Leaders for Planetary Health Organization uh, founded by the amazing Dr. Nicole De Paula, and I'm lucky to be part of the global team of this network as an, as, as an associate member. So, and also through another network that I formed uh, through Dr. Kim, who had invited me last year at the One Health Conference in Berlin, really enabled me to be, uh, to, to be part of this uh, initiative in a big way. And also through the funding of support uh, from DAD, uh, the German exchange program, we were able to come up with achievable activities that have been shared already uh, in the formed, net, in the formed uh, website and also social media channels that will help us spread the information about our hub and what is all about it. And also thanks to technology, I, I mean, the community can now be able to engage in our online activities quickly and interact with others as well. It's an interesting thing that is really an emerging pattern. As we are now speaking with more than 800 people, that was unthinkable for us one year ago. Similar, the networking opportunities with the Eastern African Hub are much faster than it was we, we could have thought six months ago. So through Zoom and other uh, kind of technology, it's much faster, it's cheaper, we can reach out, we have short conversations. We are doing a similar but smaller lecture series now in Eastern Africa. 
that you are moderating and uh, there will be also action workshops and so on and so forth. So it's an interesting opening for action through technology. Um, last question, what, how can change agents and participants here in the lecture series support what you are doing? Because I think we are all aware how important global partnership is. So how can we support you? How can uh, any student kind of or, or doctor support the activities of you and your colleagues? Okay, actually the change agent in other parts of the world uh, can support my work through collaboration and also sharing experiences on lessons learned from our activities or the activities. And also we, we can do this by publishing together and also learning how to publish jointly on issues that are similar, uh, that are related to planetary health uh, issues. And also we can uh, benchmark activities from others and uh, from the planetary health community. For instance, now that um, I Planetary Health Academy has been able to come up with the online lecture series that has been successful, at least here in Eastern Africa as well, we are also, we started on uh, with doing a lecture series as well. So, and people are really happy about it. And also I think uh, seeing also potential study research work um, to focus on, in to focus on in the Eastern Africa and also the Sub-Saharan Africa in general. This would be really interesting by maybe writing proposal, project proposal together. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Melvin. So I think we take questions now. So back to Sylvia. Yeah, or Sophie, if you have any you. from the audience. Yeah, I actually have a lot of questions from the audience. You're very lively, so thank you for that. And please apologize if we can't answer all of them, but I'm really happy that you're all so active. Um, one question is maybe um, a bit more, uh, yeah, looking forward to the future. Um, and is what would be your priorities for the planetary health community in the next one or two years? What do you think we all should prioritize and focus on? Um, I think we should mostly focus on the global, uh, the, it's called what the global uh, South communities, because we are really facing a lot of challenges uh, here in Africa, especially. So if we can have a strategy where we can identify some research work that can be, re that can be relevant to us so that we can actually try to solve some issues that are really affecting us from this end, I think that would be helpful so that uh, people can really be interested in engaging in the global planetary health move movement from this end as well, yeah. I actually would like to add to this that uh, I think it's very important what you're saying and Sam was also referring to how kind of the idea and the concept of planetary health is now also getting traction in the global south. It's very important to support this. I think it's also important for us in Germany and Europe to focus on really spreading the word getting a basic education and the basic understanding of how things connect with climate change and health, planetary health, out to our peers in, in, in uh, the health community, but also out to the public. And for example, in Germany, we have a lot of important elections in the next year. Let's make the topic of climate change and health, of planetary health, one of the key topics for the election, so that no one who wants to get into parliament gets through if they are not clear clearly having a position. I think it's now a thing where we need to get much more broader and really out. I also see that uh, because of the COVID crisis, the understanding of the relevance of health is much bigger than it was before. So it's really important for us to learn how to bring the message across in one minute talks and three minute talks and 10 minute talks and half an hour talks, depending on the context. And that all of us get courageous in just stepping up and kind of sharing and, and making examples and bringing these connections home. Sabine, I assume you also want to add something. It's you. Sure. I can. No, I, I, I don't know what's the exact priorities. I think there's lots of things needed at the same time. And like to me, maybe the priority is to grow the movement because there's so many things we need to do that we need all the people who are um, already interested and engaged, but not active yet to get active. I think that's that that would really help it. Yes, thank you so much. Um, 
I'll, I have a bit more specific question for Melvin. There was a question on how exactly are the workshops looking like that you are doing or planning in the hub. Um, maybe you can give a little insight on that. Actually, um, now that um, majority of the people from the Eastern Africa didn't know the term planetary health, so through this work, through this uh, lecture series, they've been able to learn about it through the first lecture series that uh, some mayors introduced um, planetary health together with me. And also, um, I would like to invite all of you to join and participate in our three remaining online lectures and uh, three interesting workshops for this year. And actually tomorrow we'll be having a, an, a, a one on online lecture series, uh, the second one on Eastern African challenges and opportunities on the way to planetary health. And this will be pre presented by wonderful speakers, um, Professor Deepo Osano of the University of Eldoret and also Dr. Martin Haman who is here with us. And also Dr. Nosiku Munyinda of the University of Zambia. So, I will welcome you to join and learn more about Eastern Africa as a representation of the Sub-Saharan Africa. So we hope that you will be able to learn from us. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, one question also I think that is driving a lot of us um, uh, and giving us sleepless nights is, will, do you all, maybe all on the panel, think that the transitions that we need to prevent irreversible damage to the ecosystems will happen in time and how can we work towards that. Sabine, you want to go first? <laughs> Someone asked this to Stefan Ramsdorf in the last um, uh, round, and, and I quite liked his answer where he said, I, I don't think about that the whole time. Will it be in time or not? And so on. it's like when you're, when you're a doctor doing an operation, you're not thinking about so much Every, every minute, if what's the prognosis and so on, you're just trying to do every single step as well as you can and then hope for the best. And that, and like, even if the chances are not 100%, it's still worth trying. So if whether my personal prognosis is this or that, I don't think matters so much, rather um, getting, getting, to, to getting active and everybody has a field where they can be active. It's research for me, it's other things for other people. I want to add something uh, from my experience in large scale projects. Um, and what I've learned there is that oftentimes for two or three or four years, you don't see if you get successful. You just don't see it because you're in the middle. But once things turn around, it can go really fast. So it's important to, see, to, to understand that, that we will have to have the courage to just move as Sabine has said and act and look at the things that are needed and how we can cooperate and just do all the things, but be prepared that for a long time, we will not see kind of if it is going to turn around or not. Maybe I can add the, the ketchup bottle analogy here. <laughs> I yeah. like but, it. But even, Sabina, when we, when, we found it, when we found it Kluge or when we had the first yeah. year of it, we never imagined that we would have lecture series like we have now. So I think there are so many examples of that over time miracles can happen. It's even something that Hannah Arendt was pointing out when Humans act together, uh, miracles are to be expected. So it's important to be courageous, to act what we think is the right thing to do, and then be trustful that it will make a difference. I think we are all aware that some of the changes we are already seeing will not go back. So it's more questions are we, can we prevent the worst things that might even occur if we are not acting, so, yeah. And to some degree, maybe it's also, how do you call that? self-fulfilling prophecy so if you if you think it's not going to work like today someone emailed me with this like really negative sort of all humans but humans are all like bad and like it's looking so what then then and you're getting into a mood that's not really helpful for making others inspired and active and of course it's true that the glass is half full and half empty at the same time but like and we have to face also the the difficult things and look them in the eye, but not like stop there and just stare at it and get really um, frustrated about it, but rather think that there is so much potential. And there's, there's if you look at these young people and so on, there's so many reasons to, and also nature is bouncing back. It has a lot of <laughs> power in it. And and so just trying in, in, and also for oneself, like how, how 
people can learn and grow, like think what you thought possible when you were in primary school and where you went later on, right? So um, yeah, I think it's it's important to believe to some degree that we can make a change and and um, and then then things like Mark, Mark, Martin likes to say miracles can happen, yeah. I think just to add on what Sabina said, I think uh, generally you just need to be passionate about whatever we do and work as a team so that we can uh, have success in the end. Yeah. Thank you very much, Melvin. I think that was a really, really nice closing phrase, I would suggest. Yeah, Sophie. Uh, together we're stronger, exactly. <laughs> yeah, not totally. So, the message was, Melvin was trying to say, like, either join our Health for Future network, create your own network in your own country, in your country. And as I mentioned in the beginning, just contact us whenever we, tr we can help you. We try to. And um, I think that's the best we can provide, like the support. And sometimes maybe even also the, the optimism, as Sabina said, but that's really important as well. And I really want to see more health for future and planetary health groups popping up in the next three, six months. <laughs> I think many people can found things and start things and connect and work together. It's also a great network of great people, dedicated, very knowledgeable, but also just great individuals to work with, like Sam and Melvin and Sabina. And so, yeah. yeah, and exactly. And then doing that actually gives yourself a lot of energy, a positive energy to continue again. If you work with like-minded people who are cool and you do something useful together, that, that's really the best, right? Yeah. <laughs> so stay with us and join us in two weeks again. Then uh, Gary Belking is coming and Nuziko Munyinda, and they're talking about more dimensions of, plant, dimension of planetary health and we're going to elaborate mental health and the aspect of also nutrition, food security, and conflict a little bit more. So we're happy to either yeah hear from you or see you in two weeks. And have a nice evening, day, whatever, wherever you're listening from. Thank you very much. <laughs>